It's like it's always ready for your hot take. In fact, you're 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 on there to give your hot take and to see the hot takes of others. Um, again, this might not matter if your hot take is here's another cute photo of my cat and you just get nothing but love back, right? And I know this, there are people who have that experience, uh, but given that I was violating the the blasphemy tests of both the left and the right on more, more or less on a weekly basis. I mean, I'm not aligned politically with the left or the right. Um, you know, it was just pain on both sides. And I, you know, I, and I had no tribe. Like if you're, if you're just on the right, you know, or, or some segment of the right, if you're, you know, Ben Shapiro, um, you have a tribe that is going to just incessantly defend you against the left. Right. And you and at a certain point, you just you learn to discount the attacks of the left because you don't care what the left thinks about you. You've priced that in. Mm-hmm. You know, you're on the right. Um, and so it is with the left. If you're in the middle and you're actually not even an especially political person, you don't even you don't care about politics. Politics are, are, are it's just an ugly necessity that you continually have to touch. But it's just you view it as a, a, an opportunity cost getting in the way of the things you actually care about. And you're not tribal, and you're not uh, re- reflexively aligned with with you know the the bullet points on on one side of the aisle or, or the other. You have you have offended everyone on both sides at some you're point. Getting ideologically yeah. spit roasted in. Yeah, and you're not, and you don't have you don't have the people who will defend you blindly. Um, because you pissed ev- them off last week yeah, with a view about yeah, X or Y. Even within your own audience, which is. Which is fine. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm very happy to have the audience I have, and I I, I like ha- having an, uh, an audience that really cares about the integrity and honesty of the very last thing I said. And if the last thing I said didn't make sense, they're going to uh, I'm going to hear about it. But social media is just the wrong platform for that kind of conversation. Do you ever think about what civilization would be like without social media? You know, some of the smartest minds of our time have had their hours captured arguing over whether men are men yeah. and women are women or not or yeah, yeah. about this particular topic or that particular topic. Do you think about how far it's set us back? Is it a net negative, net positive overall, do you think? Well, I think it's a net negative. I think it's a massive opportunity cost for almost everybody. Uh, I, mean, I just think where, you, know, you look at what you're doing and not doing based on your engagement with these platforms. I mean, you're not tending to read good long books anymore. At minimum, even if it's your job to read those books, it's become harder to do that. And I wasn't certainly noticing that for myself. Um, it's uh, we're just it has served to fragment our attention and our lives in ways that I just can't be good. You know, even if again, even if your diet of information is almost entirely positive, there's this fragmentation effect. You know, it's like you're just. I mean, I notice people, I certainly I notice young people now who are, who appear almost neurologically incapable of watching a great movie from beginning to end without interruption. You know what's cool? If you Google the number of cuts in the first Fast and Furious movie mm-hmm. compared with the number of cuts in the 10th Fast and oh, Furious yeah. movie, yeah. pace. Right, yeah. It's got to be sped up. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm noticing this with my daughters. It's just like, to get them to watch a movie... And you know it's you know, not it's, have a it's, second it's, screen. Yeah, it's not. It's not that it's impossible, but I just noticed that they're they're tuned to a different cadence, and um, and they're not even on. I mean, they're you know they're not on social media in the normal way. I mean, they don't have social media accounts. They're just but the, the, the YouTubeification of everything has gotten in, and um, yeah, I, I think it's worth resisting. You know, it's not that we don't have to use these tools in some way, but I think it is worth realizing that. Even beyond time, your attention is what you have. Your true wealth is the quality of your attention. And we have, we've now interfaced with machinery that has systematically degraded our ability to pay attention. David Perel has this idea called the never-ending now. And mm-hmm. if you look at the content that you've consumed, maybe not you after your exit, but most mm-hmm. people, almost all of the content that you have consumed today has been made in the last 24 hours. Right. It's right. never-ending now. It's yeah. terrifying. Yeah. It's the opposite of Lindy. It's the opposite of the Lindy effect. Right. It, it, it is so thoughtless, and it's yet it's captivating, right? I mean, it's just this sugar high of uh, you know everything. So, 
um, yeah, so I'm, you know, I've, I'm more focused on good books now than I was before I deleted my Twitter account, which, which, is, which is good. You know? Have you reflected much on Tucker Carlson's move to Twitter from Fox News? Is this the beginning of some legacy to alternative media breakwater event, or is it just a, a nothing to you? Well, I mean, I think Tucker Carlson himself is uh, worth considering. I mean, we know, you know, he's he's someone who has shilled for Trump you know, rather avidly for years, and yet we now have his behind-the-scenes commentary on the Trump phenomenon, describing him as a demonic force and somebody who he hates with a passion. That's it, what Tucker said about Trump? Yeah, this came, this came out of his texts, got leaked from the, the Dominion lawsuit against Fox. Okay. Right, so we know, like, like the mismatch between who he is pretending to be for his au- his audience and who he is behind closed doors is something that I think should trouble his audience, but it apparently doesn't, right? And, that, and that's also true of uh, someone like Trump. So you, it, it, in many cases, you have these characters who, to my eye, are very low integrity people. I mean, they're not, they, you know, you're not getting an honest look at what they really think, even though they're purporting to tell you what they think every hour of the day, or at least every day for some hours. Um, and, you know, I view Tucker as that sort of person, but I, I you know, I think it, we're in a, we're on a political landscape now where there's no impediment to his building an enormous business on the basis of, of having left Fox or having you know, gotten fired from Fox um, for reasons that, which I guess are still obscure. Um, I mean, he's very good at what he does. He's a very good demagogue and he's, he's very facile. Um, I don't think there's an ethical core there, but there's a, a political one, you know, or certainly an, an opportunist uh, one in, in the political space. And there's, a, there's a, an immense appetite to have someone call bullshit on the powers that be, the so-called elites, the institutions, again and again and again, whether they're right or wrong, you know, it's just like it's it's a this is how it sort of opens the door to conspiracy thinking of every flavor. Um, it's not that these contrarian takes are always wrong because they're they're not right. I mean, we have we're living through a time where many of our institutions have lost trust for good reason, right? And, but get, what gets layered on top of that are just you know, lies and misinformation and half-truths and, and uh, a crazy sort of, you know, John Nash style connect the dots with everything. And you can, you can find, an, if you're just searching for anomalies and you're not actually held to any sort of coherent standard of, of having a basic theory as to what's going on, you just can find the next anomaly. Well, then you'll find anomalies everywhere and they don't have to add up to anything except a kind of pornography of doubt. Right, and that's that's what's being spread by people like Tucker, in my view. Did you see Douglas Murray's debate with Malcolm Gladwell, mm-hmm. and Matt Taibbi, Malk? I, I saw. Malk. I saw. Um, or I think I heard uh, most of it. Yeah. Yeah, and on yeah. that, it was a discussion around: is the new alternative media? Is this where we're getting the most truth from? That unencumbered, the audience capture incentives are there, but also. You are liberated to not be tamped down by whoever the bigwigs are that have got some nefarious agenda. Right. But then the other side is saying it's this freewheeling Wild West where people can just make all manner of these sorts of claims. What did you yeah. make of, uh, of that landscape? Well, I mean, I, so I'm very biased for that particular debate. I, I love Douglas. Douglas is a friend and he's, he's obviously brilliant and just a joy to listen to. Um, and I get a lot of his hate mail because, again, he's, again he's, he's somebody who's happily on the right or right of center who doesn't have to worry about what the left thinks about him. But, you know, every time I have him on the podcast, I get nothing but pain from half my audience. If there is anything yeah, that is yeah. worth the pain of half of yeah. your audience, it's bringing Douglas Murray. In. Yeah, yeah. No, he's fantastic. But um, he is adjacent to many people who are not so fantastic. Right? I mean, this is, this is the sort of guilt by association problem that he has... Um, navigated in a way which I, you know, I don't know if it's successful. I mean, it, it, he's, I think, sleeps soundly at night given what he's done. But the truth is, 
he has been he's shared stages with people who i wouldn't want to be on stage with and i don't think it was good for him to be on a stage with the person and half of the reason why i would get hate mail about having douglas on would be because he shared the stage with those people um and yet it's he's completely correct in recognizing how hopeless it is to do a full moral inventory of everyone you might be you know forced to shake hands with and to decide in advance whether it's worth shaking their hands or having a conversation with them um so yeah i mean we just it is the wild west and you just have to do your best and uh just be honest uh, whenever you're in front of the microphone it feels to me like that guilt by association thing seems to have slowed at least a little bit Piers Morgan put out a, a video recently about uh, we're at peak woke. I'd, yeah. I, I wouldn't agree. I think, uh, I can't remember whether it was it was Matt Taibbi or, or, or somebody else in the, the summer of 2020 said that that was peak woke. Mm-hmm. Uh, the most you know, inflammatory, over the top, any slight indiscretion is worth being smashed in the face for. Right. Uh, I wouldn't agree that that's the case now. And it seems to me like there is at least a little bit more reason beginning to seep back in to that discourse. Mm-hmm. I, I hope so. I, I feel like it seems to be the case for me, except I don't know if it's just a an optical illusion because I'm no longer on Twitter and I no longer care, right? Like, so I just don't, you know, I use, the, 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 there's certain kinds of attacks which a few years ago I might have taken seriously for 15 minutes and now they just... Or an entire I, holiday yeah, in Hawaii. Yeah, but now they just bounce off or I don't even see them, right? So, um, and... That may be a good thing. I mean, certainly, it's a nicer way of being in the world, but it, it could be a version of, of um, something like digital leprosy, right? Where you're like, you know, the lepers lose their digits because they don't they, they don't sense pain anymore, and they, you, know, you walk by a table and you whack your fingers on it, and you don't notice that they're bleeding. Um, I'm thinking the worst cases in the developing world, literally, you know, rats can come gnaw on you while you're sleeping, and you don't feel that either. Um, so it could be that I have a, a, a digital version of that, which is just that I just don't, I'm not noticing how my reputation is eroding in ways that I actually would care about if I could notice it, but I, I can no longer sense it because I'm in my own uh, silo. Um, but the truth is I just don't care about certain kinds of uh, attacks anymore. And so, yeah, I, I have the perception you have that the pendulum has swung back People are rolling, even people who would otherwise have been taken in by wokeness uh, a few years ago, roll their eyes in private and increasingly in public yep. over certain kinds of you yep. know, you know, you know, ad hominem or bad faith arguments. Or, um, but back, so back to this point with Douglas, I mean, I just, you know, so my bias was, I, I, you know, his side carried that debate, you know, spectacularly well. Um, but... And the truth is, I don't know Malcolm. I've, well, I've been on his podcast, but I, so I've spoken to him, but I don't know Malcolm. Ma- Malcolm has a... It's not the first time he's done this in debate. He has, a, he has a habit in debate of being ad hominem in a way that is... If it's ever persuasive, it, it's not persuasive when he's doing it. And so it just... You sort of lose uh, just uh, just by default, whatever the actual topic, uh, uh, you know, under discussion. Do you remember the talk that you gave on death and the present moment? I think yeah, it was the yeah. atheist, Australian New Atheist Society, something like that. It was a big, uh, it was called the Global Atheist Convention, but, or a Global Atheist Alliance, but um, I, th- I think at, the, at that point, maybe still, it was like the biggest atheist convention ever. Um, so I, I went to a few of those, but that was, that was one. How should it inform the way that we live our lives, do you think, given that we know that they're going to end sooner or later? Well, I really think that is the, uh, whether you think about it or not, that is the ever-present subtext to almost everything you, you care about, should care about, fail to, you know, when, you, when your priorities are not straight, you know, you, you, when, you, when you have regrets, it's in light, it's against this, the, uh, the incessant ticking of the clock that, the, that all of that makes sense and the, and the imperative of, of um, 
the incremental loss of this non-renewable resource. You know, it's like it's, it's the one thing you don't get back. I mean, as I said, I think even more than time, attention is is the the real cash value of time. But um, because we know that you can safeguard your time and squander it, right? So it's like it's it's and you and we know you can find real joy, surprising joy and equanimity and and even transcendent experience in the midst of experiences that you wouldn't otherwise think were optimal, right? You can have, you can, you can be in a shitty situation where nothing has really gone the way you expected and still be radiantly happy, right? I mean, it really is a matter of what you're doing with your attention and, and the kind of mind you have. Um, but the fact is, is that everything is changing at every moment and we're not, there's no real stability, right? There's no final stage of control over experience every every goal you attain becomes a memory the moment you attain it right and then you then you're just left to think about it right and then the question is what are you going to do next and we have this perpetual challenge of figuring out what to do next i mean what you know morally intellectually as a matter of just trying to to safeguard our own sense of well-being and you're never you never arrive and it's because of the, 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 the nature of impermanence that you never do. I mean, everything is, in fact, a mirage if you think that your satisfaction is going to be a matter of finally putting all of the, the most important features of your life in the correct place, right? Like, you finally have the job you want, the relationship you want, the house you want, you know, you're, you're, you're fit, you're healthy, you're like, you, you, you've just, you've, you've executed on the perfect to-do list and you finally arrived, well, at a minimum, you're going to notice that all of that has to be maintained at great energy, right? Like, like it, it, it take, entropy is such that, you know, you can't stay fit, you can't stay healthy, you can't stay rich, you can't stay, you can't, your, your relationship's not going to maintain itself. And what's more, most people's minds are out of control anyway, right? And, and they're not satisfied anyway, even having everything. They, the moment you have everything, your your sense of what you want, I mean, you just move the goalposts, or they got moved for you by some hand that you could never see. And so, like, you take all of this for granted, and now you want other things. And you want them just as much as you wanted the last things. Uh, so, there is this, there, there's something about the passage of time that as you pay attention to it and as you get older this this is relevant but you know, some people get manage to get quite old without uh, getting especially wise uh, but other things can happen even when you're young you can you know you can lose people close to you or you can, you can suffer some profound career setback or something can happen where you recognize okay this is there's a there's a false premise here. There's many, there are many bright, shiny objects I've been focused on because they've been you know, captivating for cultural and psychological reasons that I never inspected and never really agreed to, but they, you know, that's just where my attention went. And there's this deeper principle, which is the effort to become happy never fully fulfills itself. Right? Because it's, it's the, the becoming part contains its own dissatisfaction right like at a certain level you have to figure out how you can be happy with whatever is already the case like to to want what you already have and then from that place move into the next moment looking to do creative beautiful fun things but your your happiness is not contingent upon those things working out in any particular way right you you, you realize that you're just at some level, you have to be process-oriented rather than goal-oriented uh, because ultimately there is only the process, right? And, you're ha and, the goals, and the goals are so... The achievement of the goals is, is such a punctate experience. It's so brief. It's just an, it's an idea. Before it happens, it's, it's an idea. The moment it happens, it's some burst of sensory experience. And then it's an idea again. It's a memory. And you're talking about it. You're talking about the thing you did yesterday. Um, so that's not good enough. That could never have been good enough for a truly satisfied life. 
We'll get back to talking to Sam in one minute, but first I need to tell you about our sponsor, BetterHelp. There might be something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals. It is unbelievably helpful to have someone professionally trained who can help you get through whatever you're facing. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account at any time and send a message to your therapist. They'll give you timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't even have to leave the house. It is a quicker, cheaper, and more convenient way to start doing therapy. And you do not know just how good the texture of your own mind could be if you started working with someone professionally trained who can help you get through whatever you're facing. You can switch therapists for free if it doesn't work out for any reason and there is no additional charge. Head to betterhelp.com slash modernwisdom to get 10% off your first month of therapy. That's betterhelp.com slash modernwisdom. Someone that you might not have been expecting to give you mindful wisdom that you might agree with. Andrew Tate has a quote yeah. where he says, uh, having things isn't fun, getting things is fun. And I think that what he's referring to there is the, the hedonic treadmill that we're talking about, the fact that right. it's in the anticipation of an event that we think it's going to happen as a club promoter for forever. And we would be creating anticipation for this next new DJ, this next new whatever that would happen. But the protracted nature of the buildup was what people looked forward to. Yeah. They looked forward to the advance of it. And when the event happened, in fact, they did a study where they got people to track. They pinged their phones and got them to track how their happiness was throughout the entirety of a night out. And the right. most fun part of a night out yeah. is getting ready with your friends yeah, before yeah, yeah. you head out of the door. Yeah, I mean, neuroanatomically, the reason why that is the case, because it's just our, our dopaminergic system gets driven not by pleasure itself, but by the expectation of pleasure. The, the things are about to get, it's the, the, the center of the bullseye is the, the, the pleasant surprise, like th this is about to get better than I was expecting, right? Like that, that's the thing that, that is truly reinforcing. Yeah, I fear I might have uh, made an error by saying that I have a, a guest coming on that I was very excited about, and now if, if someone isn't ex is sufficiently excited about right. you, then I've, yeah. their dopaminergic system is going to fall through yeah, the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one disappointment after another. <laughs> but so, I mean, like Andrew Tate's a perfect example of somebody who, again, he's not, um, he's radioactive for obvious reasons. I haven't met him. I haven't done an especially deep dive on what he's guilty of, or, you know, I mean, he's obviously he's He's got issues, but um, I just feel like we're, we're at a moment now where I mean, there there is such a, a thirst for wisdom that you know it's just, it can come from so many different places, and and those places can be more or less contaminated with concepts that are more or less toxic, more or less divisive, more or less confusing, and. Yeah, I mean, I've you know, I've watched enough of his stuff to see why young men are getting addicted to his content and thinking that he's their their life guru. Uh, and I've also watched enough to think that it's not um, it's not ideal that he's the voice of a generation. Right? Like, we need a a um, a more compassionate, less self infatuated standard for manliness and, and success than, if, than what he's, he's putting out. If I was to, I've got Jordan uh, coming on the show again mm -hmm. at some point later this year, and it's something that I think I'll speak to him about, that he's onto big things with this arc, which is kind of his competitor, I think, to the WEF that he's doing later this yeah, year. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't followed that yet, no. Um, but I do think that Jordan's relative abandonment of the conversation directly to young men uh, mm -hmm. to move on to other things, whether it be climate change or the trans issue or pick your poison about whatever he's got interested in recently, uh, I think that that has left a vacuum and you can't mm -hmm. expect young, you can't expect anybody to go through life without insights coming from somewhere. And whether that insight is for young men or young women or old men or old women, whether it's Andrew Tate or, mm -hmm. you know, Whoopi Goldberg or whoever happens to have the hot take of the week and, and trend sufficiently highly on Twitter, uh, people are going to look for someone. They're going to look for answers. And in a world where we are chronically mismatched, our evolved psychology and the world that we find ourselves in has n never really been further apart. People right. are going to find answers. And, and sometimes fluency is a really brilliant proxy for truthfulness or insight. 
Mm. And if you can say things with a sufficiently well-rounded, compelling delivery, regardless of who you are, yeah. whether it be Whoopi Goldberg or, or anybody else, uh, people will say, that sounds, that sounds true. It sounds fluent. I'm not sure if it's true. Yeah, except the, the thing that surprises me is that it should be more obvious than it is to more people that someone's an asshole. Right? It's like that. Like it doesn't matter how fluent you are. You are. You're only just declaring your assholery in in more concise form. Right? Um, and so it, it's kind of a Trumpian moment. Like Trump is obviously an asshole. He's obviously a, a selfish person. But nobody, none of his fans care. Right? He's like he's not a compassionate person. He's, he, he can't even pretend to care about people, really, right? He's, but his, his shamelessness around his selfishness has become a kind of superpower for a certain audience because he's, he's conveying the message, I will, never ju- I will never judge you because I'm incapable of judging myself, right? Like, I'm not, I, I'm not holding myself to any kind of standard apart from the gratification of my own desires. So... You know, I'm, I'm in, in some sense, I have a real integrity because I know I'm selfish. All those people who are pretending not to be selfish, who are pretending to be ethical and compassionate, to care about, you know, the sub-Saharan Africa and, uh, you know, education in developing countries. I mean, someone like Bill Gates, right? No, Bill Gates is somebody who can't get laid and he's just going to microchip you with the next vaccine, right? Like that, that's this is going to be a great uh, quote to export from this podcast. Um, uh, you're welcome, Twitter. Um, that's so. That's the that's the center of narrative and ethical gravity for these guys. Right? I don't I don't include Jordan there, but like Andrew Tate, Trump. There's like a I've got a fucking Bugatti, and you know you want one, and I've got no apologies. Right? I've got no fucks to give. Uh, I know you want to be like me, you know. And if you don't, if you're not good enough to be like me. I'll sleep with your girlfriend. Right? Like that's that's the that's not an ethically wise person on any fucking level even if he can even if he can string together a few sentences that seem actionable and useful to get you to clean your room and get in shape and and meet a girl right um we should be asking more of our elders than that right and and so and and so where i part ways with jordan again I, i do not put jordan um in the same category but he is, he has a very different view of the, the, the kind of the status of objective empirical truth in relation to the stories we tell about uh, ourselves and our place in the world and um, what makes life worth living, what, what, allow, what will allow for a society to really cohere around shared values. Um, and he thinks that there's a, a layer of storytelling and you know what I would what I would call myth and fiction really in a, in a way that is kind of somewhat derogatory right it's not to say that I'm, I'm I don't see the power in it but it's just I what I want to do is be able to distinguish between the a layer of wishful thinking and a layer of delusion and a layer of uh, ancient confusion that is still has good standing among millions of people and probably some symbolic truth or figurative truth in there too and and a kind of harmless harmless uses of the imagination that are could be ennobling and fun and empowering right um and kind of core truths that don't require a story to be ennobling did you see that jordan got into it with richard dawkins and well you wouldn't have done you're you're off twitter so i will no i'll uh, be the weather vane to update you on whatever's happening in Twitter's conditions at the moment. Uh, Richard, a clip of Richard went semi-viral of him criticizing the Old Testament God. Right. And then I think Jordan basically c- called him out anytime, any place, anywhere. It wasn't far off that. I think that the actual right. tweet was right. about saying that it was, uh, I think, damaging science and 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 doing a disservice to maybe Dawkins himself and, and, and some right. other stuff. Yeah. Well, so I mean that's. I mean, I agree with Richard uh, with respect to the what I think of the, the, the Old Testament God and the, the moral instruction we can or can't take from him. I mean, I just think that's—I I just don't think that the 
the Bible is the wisest book we have, even though there are, there are pearls of real wisdom there, which I, I you know, understand that people love. Um, it's a book. It was clearly written by human beings, right? So like, the, the fundamental, the, the, the breach point is not, is, is upstream of many of the things people might want to debate. There's just this basic claim. We, we've got millions upon millions of books Were they all written by people or not, right? And the moment you admit that they were all written by people, okay, we're having a very different conversation about the status of religion. Certainly, the religion of, of a, any of the religions of Abraham, right? I mean, these are these are claims at bottom. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are claims about the divine origin of, of a specific book or s- certain texts. Um, and some of these texts were canonical for centuries and then got thrown out, you know, within within Christianity, and then some got added later. Um, and so the the process of cobbling together these these scriptures was all too human. We know way too much about it. If you if we knew more about it, it would look much more like Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon, and the, and it would look like a you know the South Park episode that Mormonism in fact looks like, right? And you drag it further into the present. And it looks like Scientology, right? And then you're like you're just staring at L. Ron Hubbard's driver's license, and it's just okay. This goofy guy with bad teeth sold all these people on a on a story about the stars that was just obviously bullshit and should have it should have been obvious to them. Now again, that's not to say that there isn't real wisdom in in all of these streams of information, even Scientology. But you just the basic claim, and I think Richard would agree with this, is that you don't have to believe anything on insufficient evidence to extract all the wisdom that is to be found in the world's literature and in the conversations, conversations with people in the present and conversations with the dead by reading their their books. In other news, this episode is brought to you by Eight Sleep. Eight Sleep's pod cover is keeping me alive in the middle of summer in Austin, Texas at the moment. Good sleep is the ultimate game changer and being too hot or too cold is a guaranteed way to ruin your night's sleep. The pod cover from Eight Sleep will actively cool and heat each different side of the bed based on yours and your partner's sleep stages. It is a complete game changer and if you're waking up in the morning feeling groggy and not sufficiently rested, it is quite likely that temperature is the culprit and all of this is fixed with the pod cover from Eight Sleep. It slips over the top of your existing mattress, just like a mattress topper, but gives you all of the biometric scanning. It'll tell you how long you were asleep for, your resting heart rate, your HRV, everything literally from a mattress topper. Head to eightsleep.com slash modernwisdom or follow the link in the show notes below for $150 off, plus they ship internationally. That's E-I-G-H-T sleep.com slash modernwisdom. The first time that I think I heard of Jordan was that first conversation that you guys had. It was a, a podcast, maybe in a bar, you in a hotel reception or something, and there was a chinking no. of glasses. Oh, no, that would have been probably Dan Dennett. Uh, oh, okay. we, uh, Dan maybe. Dennett and I had a debate in a bar, but okay. you know, Jordan and I had a debate on my podcast. Right, well, I'd heard this, yeah. uh, heard this conversation, and I remember thinking, like, who's this Canadian fuck having a pop right. at Sam Harris yeah. Uh, yeah. at the time, and then later on went on to, to really sort of fall in love with Jordan's work as well. I think there's an awful lot of people who want to see that uh, public relationship between you and him rekindled. Uh, well, it, it hasn't, I mean, I mean to, to, to my eye, it has not uh, been broken. I mean, I, I like Jordan. I mean, I, I think I mean, this is just, this is what I imagine because I have not had any dialogue with him in, in a couple of years. But, um, I mean, Jor- Jordan and I disagree fundamentally about religion, I think. And we've debated that, you know, ad nauseum. And we've probably got like 12 hours, uh, you know, on, on the mic in various venues debating that um, and that was fun and I'm always happy to, to talk to him um, and I think he while we disagree I think he has really helped millions of people I mean I think he's he, there's no question I've I, I know what it's like to be with him at an event and to hear from the people who who are you know hear from his fans and my fans side by side sitting at a table for an hour after a, an event where we you know had a debate in front of 8,000 people um, 
And there's a slightly different flavor to the people whose lives we've changed, right? He's, he's intersected with a, with a different group of people at a different point in their lives than I have for the most part. How would you and, categorize that difference? Well, I mean, to, to a significant degree, is people moving in two opposite directions. I mean, like, they're, they're the people who were stuck with a religious worldview, stuck, I mean, literally, in, in many cases, traumatized by a fear of hell that had been inculcated into them by their religious parents, but were enamored enough of enlightenment values and secular rationality and science so as to have the this the spell break to some significant degree and they needed some language to to help kind of midwife their delivery into a into the clear light of, of, of reason right and they also needed so and this is where Richard and I have kind of have had different jobs I mean Richard is just critiquing religion and counterposing it with all that's wonderful about science right and so for him the the spiritual attitude that is on offer when you want to leave religion behind and you know you know close the church doors behind you is awe at the beauty of nature and just amazement at you know everything we are learning and may yet learn about the way the world works and the way the, the mind works and um, I mean we are now to use Newton's image, I mean, it's like we are children on a seashore playing with shells and the, the vast ocean of, of ignorance and potential knowledge it just you know, awaits our, our inspection. Um, for me, that's not good enough, right? What I mean by spirituality has, in fact, nothing to do with the amazement that you feel when you look up at the Milky Way, right? It's like, that, that's, that's great, but that's just not, that's just not the the real opportunity on offer and that's not what's going to prepare us to die you know and that's not what's going to really console you at four in the morning when you wake up feeling bad about your life and not sure how you can be happy in this world right um so i'm much more so i i'm convinced that at the core of every religion there was there there were real transformative and and transcendent human experiences that are attested to by the literature and traditions that have grown up around that religion. So there really was, you know, presumably there really was a person, you know, in history by the name of Jesus, who had this effect on the people around him, and said, you know, something like what he is purported to have said in the Bible. And I can I can understand all of that as a, a an absolutely predictable result of certain ways of, of paying attention that are available to every human being now, you know, then, now, then and now, um, which allow you to recognize that the, this ego you take yourself to be is an illusion. And it allows you to recognize that unconditional love is actually a possibility, right? Like you can, it's possible to just feel shattered by your love for all sentient beings and to just to bask in the profundity of that way of being and that's on the menu and whether you have to just whether you have to go into a cave and meditate for a month to find that or you take mdma or you have there are ways to perturb your nervous system such that the testimony of someone like jesus or buddha is not is obviously not a fraud it's obviously not a confession of psychopathology it's obviously not a delusion about uh, you know, belief-based delusion about what happens after death, or about invisible parts of the universe, and you know, populated by angels or, or deities. Um, you don't have to believe in anything unempirical in order to experience that range of of positive experience. You just have to learn to use your attention in the right ways. And and if you can't do that, you know, there are you know, psychedelics offer a, a an imperfect method at for, reliable, for glimpsing huh? that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely reliable. It's a reliable glimpse of something that is different enough. Uh, assuming you have a positive experience, I mean, you can have a different enough negative experience that will convince you of something else. But <laughs> if you have a different enough, extraordinarily positive experience, you'll be convinced that okay, what whatever the possibilities of sustaining that may or may not be. It is just clear that this experience is possible because I just had it, right? I just had it for four hours, and 
I can no longer imagine that human consciousness is is in principle confined to kind of the, the mediocre bandwidth I tend to experience when I'm just checking my email and then checking Twitter and then worrying about my future. Right. I, I actually I actually don't think I, I, I actually closed the loop on what um, I wanted to say about Jordan there though. So Jordan Jor, Jordan and I differ in he wants to support a much more traditional picture of the utility and even necessity of religious thinking and religious identity and and that way of giving meaning to one's life through traditional stories and, and sto- stories which I think tr- a literal belief in can't be justified based on what we have come to understand about science and um, I just think that the burden is on us at this point in history to find a truly non-sectarian way of telling ourselves a story about what we value and what is possible, right? And and so, and we do that in other areas of our lives. I mean, science is one very clear place we do that, uh, where there's just, there is no, to say that, you know, there's American science versus Chinese science. I mean, it's just, that's just not science. It, like so science is at a layer more fundamental than those cultural differences. Um, and so it has to be with a, with something like ethics and spirituality. You can't talk in the end. You can't. You shouldn't be able to talk about Christian ethics or Christian spiritual insight. And Jordan's not convinced of that, or he's apparently not convinced of that. And so you know that we, that's what we still disagree about. But I think the final the thing the thing the thing I wanted to say was that. So you you will seem to allude to some sort of breach between us, which I certainly don't feel and haven't experienced. I can only imagine, though, that in his world, given wh- given what was happening to me on Twitter when I left, he perceives me as somebody who has just um, gone off the rails in some way, right? Because, like, he, he in his world, and this this is what was so amazing to see um, when I was looking at Twitter when I when I, when I, I mean this to if anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about. There was this whole Hunter Biden laptop situation where I, I commented on the Hunter Biden laptop thing uh, on a podcast. A clip from that podcast got exported to you know, apparently every planet in the solar 